thank you for inviting me to give the talk here. I'm really happy that Landscapes Live is still going strong. And I can only recommend the new people to uh, sign up for the team because it's a really uh, nice group of people and you get a good uh, sense of the geomorphological um, community, I think, from uh, joining this effort here. Yeah. So um, the theme of my talk today is the influence of surface processes uh, on the solid earth, ice sheets, and sea level. And I'll present some previous work, some results that have come out of an ongoing project, including some preliminary results. And then I'll end my presentation today just saying a few words about a new project that I'm starting this summer. Before, uh, before I move uh, on, I'll just like to emphasize that a lot of people have uh, contributed to the work that you'll see here. And particularly, I want to highlight a PhD student, Gustav Jungdahl Olsen, that has really led uh, much of the work that I'll be presenting today in my talk. So uh, in my work, I'm really interested in the influence of surface processes on solid earth, ice sheet and sea level. And these three components are already seen as being very closely linked. And uh, my interest is now to explore how important surface processes are in this context. And by surface processes, I mean, for instance, the formation of deep fjords, but also in general, how landscape evolution, both erosion and deposition will influence this coupled system of solid earth, ice sheet and sea level. And let's see my, if I can advance here. So particularly, I want to highlight two things of interest. First of all, how changes in topography will influence the behavior of ice sheets and also how much ice they can hold. As uh, you may know, I previously worked on interactions between glacial erosion and ice extent on a local catchment scale. But here I'm really trying to focus now on the scale of a larger ice sheet so that the ice volume changes that uh, we will find will also start to play a role for the global sea level. And then the other aspect I would like to highlight relates to the influence of the surface processes on the solid earth and sea level. So how erosion and deposition will result in solid earth deformation, much like glacial isostatic, uh, glacial isostatic adjustments, but working on different time scales and, uh, than the ice sheet uh, and also representing permanent changes in, in the topography. And uh, most of my talk today will be about this uh, second component, but I will show some preliminary results uh, in the end, fo focusing on the influence of topography for ice sheet behavior uh, in the context of the former Scandinavian ice sheet. So uh, my motivation uh, for this work came originally from the landscapes that we see both in Greenland and in Scandinavia today. So from both sides of the North Atlantic. And you see here examples of these two landscapes and you see uh, for both cases, a very characteristic uh, landscape with these high elevation, low relief surfaces uh, separated by deep fjords. And it is uh, easy to see the similarities between these two margins actually. But the formation of these landscapes have been debated uh, actually for more than a century. And particularly it's been debated what the role of glacial erosion has been. So has the ice only carved out the deep fjords over deepening existing fluvial valleys, or has there been significant glacial erosion in the whole landscape, uh, including also erosion uh, on these high elevation plateaus? And particularly, of course, if the ice has left these plateaus uh, untouched, they can, and they also have been, uh, used as indicators for tectonic uplift. But uh, in any case, these different interpretations of the evolution of the topography and the landscape will have implications for both our understanding of the long-term ice history and also the amount of erosion-driven isostatic uplift we can expect. Um, and that will influence both uh, ice and sea level. Yeah, 
So in my talk today, I'll actually jump a little bit back and forth between these two landscapes, the two margins, because they really complement each other uh, very, very well, as they both hold unique observations. So obviously in Greenland, we can study uh, the ice as an analog for what, what used to be in Scandinavia. And in Scandinavia, we can study the bed as an analog for what is under the Greenland ice sheet today. And in addition, in Greenland, we have, we find sediments onshore that can help us understand the evolution of the margin. Whereas the offshore record around Greenland is uh, not particularly well dated or mapped. Uh, on the other hand, in Scandinavia, we have very few sediments onshore, while the offshore sediment record uh, has been mapped in great detail. So some things we can investigate best in Greenland and other processes we can still understand better in Scandinavia. But I would like to start out uh, in Greenland, uh, mentioning this earlier paper by Sergei Medvedev and co-authors from 2008. And in this paper, they discuss the present day occurrence of old marine sediments that are nowadays uh, at an elevation up to 1.2 kilometers above the fjord. So these are uh, late Permian to mid Cretaceous sediments that were deposited near or below sea level and now today have been uplifted. So they're sitting more than a kilometer above the fjord level. Uh, and in this uh, paper, they uh, showed that the elevation of these old uh, marine sediments can be explained to a large extent, at least by glacial erosion. So erosion mainly in the fjords uh, and actually up to three kilometers of uh, erosion in some places. And the unloading of this material onshore and the loading of it due to deposition in the offshore will result in a permanent rebound of the solid earth uh, that they suggest in this region to amount to about 1.1 kilometer. Uh, and this uplift, of course, has influenced uh, the ice sheet in this region significantly. Um, but there is a problem here. Uh, the limitation is that, uh, in fact, there's no way that we can really constrain the uplift uh, in time when it took place. So we cannot really constrain uh, the time scale over which these processes might work and also what time scale uh, they will be important for the evolution of the ice sheet. So in principle, these sediments could have been uplifted uh, partly already prior to glaciation because of uh, fluvial, fluvial incision or tectonic movements. But in this study, at least they showed the potential for glacial erosion to cause significant uplift uh, in this order of magnitude that will uh, influence the behavior of the ice sheet. Okay, so uh, we followed uh, up on this uh, work later on, particularly trying to constrain the timing of these processes. And we managed to do this uh, both in North Greenland and in Northeast Greenland using the occurrence of late Pliocene, early Pleistocene marine sediments that are exposed on shore today. And actually we also used this study to argue something about the early development of uh, extensive ice in these regions. So uh, one of the geological observations that have been used to infer past ice and climate conditions in Greenland is the Cap Kribbenhaun formation that you find uh, in this very northern uh, location of Greenland. And uh, the sediment formation here has been mapped and described already in the 80s by Sven Funder and others uh, to be shallow marine sediments of a late Pliocene to early Pleistocene age. So uh, deposited below sea level around uh, 2.5 million years ago. Uh, and actually just last year, uh, researchers from uh, Globe, uh, the Globe Institute in Copenhagen, they found the oldest preserved DNA in these sediments as well. And in that study, they argue for an age of uh, 2 million years but that is still very uncertain. But uh, people have uh, published extensively on these sediments, uh, what they can tell us about uh, climate conditions and the flora and fauna that existed in this region uh, at that time. However, prior to this study, uh, no one had really discussed the fact that these sediments are now uplifted above sea level and uh, what mechanism uh, that can, uh, 
that uh, is responsible for this uplift. Uh, and the current location of these marine sediments at Cap Curran is at an elevation between 130 and 250 meters uh, above sea level. So we really have uh, an uplift constraint in time, 250 meters or more if we've had erosion of the top surface since the uh, two or 2.5 million years ago when this uh, formation was deposited below sea level. And there is in fact a, a number of locations along the coast here in North and Northeast Greenland where we find uh, elevated marine sediments of the Pliopleistocene age. But with a decreasing trend in elevation when we go uh, towards the south. Uh, so down uh, down here in Skorspisund, uh, a similar geological formation is found at elevations between 24 and 62 meters above sea level. So uh, I just want to mention also that the uplift pattern that we see from these marine sediments with the largest uplifts towards the north that's actually opposite the pattern we see in the present day uh, topography with low uplift uh, where we have high topography and uh, vice versa. And in addition to that, the uplift pattern is also opposite uh, predicted dynamic uplift uh, in the region, which uh, would be associated with the Icelandic thermal anomaly uh, southeast from here. Um, so since the marine sediments we find uh, down at Skorspison, furthest to the, to the south in our study area, they uh, have seen a very limited uplift uh, in the region here. And they are closest to the thermal anomaly around uh, Iceland. Uh, we can sort of infer that uh, the uplift patterns we see uh, do not have a dynamic origin. At least that's what we um, assume in this work here, yeah? Okay, so uh, in this work, we've tried to then explain the current elevation of these uh, sediments, the marine sediments at the coast by flexural isostatic adjustments as a result of glacial erosion and fjord formation. And so the underlying assumption here is that uh, ice sheets have behaved as a very selective erosion agent, meaning that the ice has focused its erosion in large valleys where it has carved out the deep fjords and the ice sheet has done much less to the surrounding regions. And that this selective erosion can result in significant surface uplift uh, or surface changes that vary in space. So while the fjords are lowered significantly, the intervening regions will be uplifted because the erosion here is simply smaller than the flexural isostatic, uh, the regional flexural isostatic response. So uh, the recipe we've used here is uh, quite simple. First, we have removed the present day uh, ice sheet um, and then we rebound the topography, which is what you see uh, here to the left in the figure. And then uh, based on this uh, reconstructed topography, we have defined fjord erosion using a fjord filling algorithm. Uh, and you see here uh, in the bottom, uh, this transect across the Skorspisund region, you can see that we fill um, we fill the topography from the black curve up to the blue curve, and then we we calculate the load of this uh, infill, and that brings the surface down to the red curve. So if we go forward in time, uh, we assume that the topography has changed from the red curve to the black curve as a result of glacial erosion. And here you see exactly that some regions have uh, outside of the fjords have experienced a significant uplift uh, in the area here. Yeah. Um, so this deflection you see in map view here uh, is the flexural isostatic uplift we would expect from the erosion of the fjords. And we can now compare this uplift with the uplift suggested by the marine sediments that have been found along the coast. And uh, to the right in the panels, the red bars are the observed uplifts inferred from the marine sediments, whereas the histograms, they are 
the fractal isostatic uplift that we expect from our estimated fjord erosion. And we then just uh, take out um, uplift estimates in a small window around each locality. And actually, we see here that there is a very good match uh, at the northern Cap Copenhagen location, where the, whereas there's a mismatch between the two uh, that increases as we go further south. And actually, when we go down to Skorsmysund, there is a mismatch between uh, our predicted uplifts and the observed ones of more than uh, 300 meters. So that means that um, up here in the north, uh, where we have a good match, uh, we need to erode the entire fjord system uh, after the sediments were deposited at around 2 to 2.5 million years ago in order to explain the current elevation of these marine sediments as a result of fractal isostatic unloading. So here in North Greenland, uh, we can constrain erosion rates in the landscape where the panel in the bottom here shows average erosion rates across the fjord system over the entire 2.5 million year time period. So we have values here ranging between close to zero and about uh, up to about half a millimeter per year. Uh, in addition, you also see uh, up here how the erosion varies with elevation in this uh, estimate. And we have a large range uh, of erosion rates at low elevations up to a value of about 0.8 millimeters per year and overall very low erosion rates and a high at high elevations. But you have to remember that these values are average rates, so assuming a constant uh, erosion, which has clearly not been the case. So if we would instead assume that uh, erosion was limited to time periods with active glaciers in the fjord systems, then the rates would increase significantly. But Perhaps uh, even more important, these results could also suggest that there has been no extensive glacial erosion in North Greenland prior to 2.5 million years ago. At least it seems that there was no fjord forming glaciations and that may suggest that there was no widespread glaciations in this region at that time. So, uh, on the other hand, if we go further south to Skorsby uh, actually much of the erosion that we map out here must have taken place prior to 2.5 million years ago, at least uh, close to the coast. So either almost all of this erosion in the fjord system took place prior to 2.5 million years ago, or alternatively, the erosion had propagated uh, inland by 2.5 million years ago, so that the locality at the coastline uh, didn't experience a fractal isostatic response to the erosional unloading. And I try to illustrate it here uh, on the figure down here, where I uh, show you the erosion driven uplift uh, based on the four different regions uh, indicated up here. And what this shows us is that as long as the erosion uh, in the region four closest to the coast happened before 2.5 million years ago, then the remaining erosion could have happened after 2.5 million years ago, and still we could match the elevation of the present day um, locality uh, with the marine sediments. It simply means that the regions uh, one to three, uh, the erosion here did, just didn't, it just doesn't contribute to uh, the coastal locality in terms of isostatic uplift as a result of erosional unloading. But in any case, uh, this suggest, uh, we suggest from this work that uh, in this uh, area in Greenland, glacial erosion and fjord formation uh, initiated prior to 2.5 million years ago. So um, this was our first attempt actually to constrain these uh, processes in time. Um, but we wanted to get uh, even more specific. And um, so more recently, we've tried in my group to look into the shorter term influence of uh, uh, the surface processes on uh, solid earth uh, deformation and sea level, uh, narrowing it down, uh, narrowing down how important they may be uh, on the time scales of a few glacial cycles. And for now, we've focused uh, only on Scandinavia because this is where we have 
the appropriate time constraints on the eroded volumes uh, from the offshore sediment record. And this work has been led by PhD student Gustav Jungal Olsen, as I said, and he has added erosion and deposition estimates for Scandinavia into a global gravitationally self-consistent sea level model. So solving for the time varying deformation of a rotating uh, Maxwell viscoelastic earth model uh, as a result of loading and unloading, unloading both due to water, to ice, and then this sediment redistribution. But before I show you the results of this new modeling setup, I will talk about how we have quantified erosion and deposition in this region. So how do we define the time varying sediment loads that go into this global sea level model? Uh, so to the left here, you see the offshore sediment thicknesses that we've compiled for the whole late Pleistocene Pleistocene period in this region from different uh, published sources. And then to the right, you see our interpretation as to where this uh, sediment came from. So some came from the fjords and the valleys. Some material came from the erosion of a wedge of older sediments along the coast. And finally, some of it came from onshore regions beyond the fjords and the valleys. And it's important to note that when we add uh, these sediment volumes uh, into the global sea level model, framework, uh, they do have different densities depending on whether they are actually bedrock or sediment. Um, so, but on the next, next few, few slides, I'll try to explain uh, in a bit more detail how we ended up with this uh, distribution of eroded material that you see on the right. And uh, this is based on some results that we published uh, a few years ago uh, in this paper. Um, but I would like to just actually shortly come back to the ma two main hypotheses that we have for the glacial imprint in the landscape in Scandinavia, here illustrated by Steer et al. from 2012. So Steer in the audience. Hi, Philip. Uh, so for the classical hypothesis, we have uh, the this dissection of an uplifted peneplain surface. Uh, and uh, here, the glacial imprint in the landscape is limited to this over deepening of existing fluvial valleys. So that's the upper, upper panel here. Uh, and then on the other hand, we have the ice hypothesis uh, where topography is long lived and both the fjords and the high elevation low relief surfaces have experienced a significant amount of glacial erosion. So shaping these low relief uh, landscapes uh, in situ. And so back in their paper in 2012, uh, Steer et al. did a sediment budget calculation to get the one step closer distinguishing between these two hypotheses. So basically comparing this, uh, the gray area of these two panels here with the offshore sediment volumes. And um, this sediment budget calculation, they showed uh, us that uh, when you try to fit the entire Late Pleistocene, uh, late Pliocene, Pleistocene offshore sediment volumes into the fjords and deep valleys, uh, there is a last, large mismatch and excess of material that you simply cannot fit into the fjords of uh, uh, up to more than 50%, actually. And uh, this points to the fact that regions outside of the fjords uh, have contributed to the deposition uh, during glacial times. So Steeridale argued for a significant amount of erosion on the high elevation, low relief surfaces up to several hundred, hundreds of meters. And this was really in contrast to the previous views uh, of the, the classical model up here, where the upper surfaces are regarded as remnants of a pre-glacial landscape uh, that has experienced only a modest amount of, of glacial erosion. But, uh, Others have then since argued that this excess material didn't actually come from the onshore high elevation, low relief surfaces, but that it actually came from erosion of the shelf region, as is uh, illustrated here on a few cross sections uh, by Hall et al. from 13. And you see here clearly, oops, sorry, you see here clearly how 
the older Mesozoic and uh, Cenozoic sediments in, in blue, orange, and yellow, uh, they are cropped below the, the glacial sediments in green. Uh, and on this figure here by Holliday, you can also see their interpretation as how to uh, how to how these preglacial sediments could be reconstructed. Um, but it's actually tricky to calculate the volumes of this uh, volume of this wedge here of the former sediments because how do you extrapolate these uh, sediment units, and what assumptions are you making about the past topography? And how far inland uh, did these sediments uh, actually go in the past? And also, how do you then extrapolate reconstructions like these uh, sections here to the broader region? But clearly, some erosion took place on the shelf. So, how can we try and quantify this uh, in a realistic manner? And so, in the paper we had uh, two years ago, we tried to quantify this shelf erosion in a way that is consistent with these onshore offshore profiles we have from the region while still extending our estimates to the entire area so that we can actually include them in this overall uh, sediment budget calculation. And uh, actually in contrast to the previous work by Stierdal, we also now include uh, a much larger uh, offshore depositional area here. We include the northern rim of the North Sea Basin and we also include the Danish area. So combined, uh, this entire area is uh, what we uh, consider uh, that has been sourced uh, from Scandinavia and the shelf. Uh, and in addition to this, we also added a component of recent dynamic surface uplift in Western Norway. And this uh, recent uplift would actually work to make room for a larger sediment wedge on the shelf back in time. Um, so this conceptual cross section you see here will also uh, illustrate the approach that we have taken. So first we remove the quaternary sediments from the offshore and fill uh, it into the fjords like this. And then we calculate the flexural isostatic adjustments uh, from these low changes. So we have a rebound in the offshore and subsidence uh, onshore. And then uh, based on this reconstructed topography and bathymetry, we define a, a wedge of eroded material by interpolating uh, from the position where these uh, older sediments uh, outcrop below the glacial sediments and then up to a level in our reconstructed topography corresponding to the highest sea level that existed during the deposition of these older sediments. And here we have assumed that the sea level was a maximum of 100 or 150 meters higher than today during the deposition of these Mesozoic and, and Cenozoic sediments. However, it's important to understand here that because we have loaded the onshore with this volume in the fjords, and because we also have a component of dynamic uh, surface uplift, uh, the upper limit of this sediment wedge that we reconstruct is not the 150 meters that was the highest then in sea level, but actually uh, it would reach up to more than 500 meters in the present day landscape if it, if it hadn't been eroded. Uh, since then. So by assuming nothing else than past aerostatic sea level changes, isostatic changes from erosion and deposition, and a moderate component of dynamic topography, we can reconstruct a sediment wedge that would uh, reach several hundred meters up in the present topography if it hadn't been eroded. And now we can add this uh, component to the overall sediment budget uh, calculation. Uh, yes, so this is actually what the wedge uh, looks like. Uh, so it has the maximum thickness of some 1300 meters here uh, south of Norway, and then it has some hundreds of meters uh, of material up along the coast. And I can also just mention briefly that, uh, that these uh, sediment thicknesses, they fit quite well with vitronite um, reflectance data that have been measured on uh, old um, Jurassic coals found here uh, close to the Bergen area. Okay, so now um, 
we, if we compare our results with those from Steer et al, uh, this is their estimate of offshore uh, volumes and onshore fjord erosion. And then obviously, if we have a larger depositional uh, region offshore, uh, the mismatch, uh, mismatch that we get is much larger, more than 60%, uh, if we do not consider this erosion on the shelf. And now adding the shelf erosion, uh, this is what it looks like. And then we can minimize the mismatch to some 35 uh, to 45%. However, this is actually still a considerable amount. And if we uh, distribute it uh, over the various regions here indicated by the colors, realistically, we get a few hundred meters of erosion uh, in, uh, in these different regions. Yeah. So uh, with these results, uh, we can get some kind of constraint on the erosion that has taken place uh, onshore in Scandinavia during the late uh, Pliocene and, uh, and the Quaternary. And with this, we have actually decided also how the complete offshore sediment volume should be distributed onshore and along the inner shelf. So then we end up uh, again uh, with this figure here to the right, where we place something in the fjords, we place something along the coast, and we uh, distribute the rest uniformly in, in the onshore regions. But now the ne next task is then to zoom in on just a few glacial cycles uh, in order to look at the transient evolution uh, of these two fields uh, so that they can be um, included in this transient sea level model. And for the offshore, uh, we are lucky that at least on the Norwegian margin, that the sediment package has already been divided into subunits with the youngest uh, T unit here uh, in gray representing the last two glacial cycles. And we decided that this should be our uh, focus time interval uh, for the study. And in the onshore, we have indications from the di distribution of sediments that are older than the last glacial maximum. And we have bedrock exposure ages uh, that tells us that erosion during the most recent glacial cycle was likely focused in the fjords and in other low-lying regions and then along the coastline, uh, as it's indicated here uh, to the right in the light gray colors. So with this in mind, we end up with these estimates here uh, of the erosion and the deposition that took place during just the last two glacial cycles. And for the image on the right, we have assumed that there is no sediment sourced from high elevations and then we have a 50-50 division between shelf erosion and fjord erosion when we have to match the offshore sediment volumes that were deposited during this time interval of just two glacial cycles. So effectively, that mean, it means that the Norwegian channel, so the bathymetric feature we have down here, uh, was eroded uh, almost entirely during the last two glacial cycles that we model here. And that actually seems fairly consistent with the existing understanding of, of that feature. So uh, we can then investigate now what the effect of erosion and deposition is uh, on solid earth deformation and sea level in this region over the last two glacial cycles. And as mentioned, we incorporate this erosion and deposition into a globally a gravitational self-consistent sea level model so that we can calculate sea level changes through time as a result of both ice and water uh, loading as well as the loading and unloading uh, effects from erosion and deposition. And in this process, we assume that erosion and deposition rates are scaled everywhere uh, over time uh, with the global ice volume. And in this model, global ice volume changes follow the global ice reconstruction called ice 60 c And uh, the penultimate glacial cycle is scaled uh, using the delta 18 curve. So uh, on the curves here, you see uh, sea level for two curves in Scandinavia. Uh, and you see sea level changes uh, for both these locations uh, with or without uh, erosion and deposition. So the solid lines 
uh, models, including erosion and deposition, and the dashed lines are excluding erosion and deposition. So you see a difference uh, between the models of about 100 meters for these two locations uh, in southern Norway over the time scales of two glacial cycles. And remember, while the isostatic effects from the ice sheet loading comes and goes, the response to erosion and deposition here is permanent. And it's resulting in this uh, slow permanent sea level fall in these regions over time, sort of superimposed on the, sea, the changes that we have from uh, the ice, uh, ice sheet changes. And to the right, you see then the response in sea level uh, from erosion and deposition of the sediments only for the entire area. And the signal is in the order of plus minus 150 meters uh, on these time scales. So just to make it clear here, we have subtracted the effects from the loading and unloading of the ice. Uh, and I would also like to emphasize here that we are looking at the effects of the geomorphic redistribution of on the solid earth and the sea surface, so the geoid, but excluding the actual if local effects from erosion and deposition, which would really complicate this, um, this picture a lot, uh, particularly in regions with high erosion or deposition. But for the sites uh, where sea level indicators are preserved at the surface, uh, we expect to have a limited erosion and or deposition, and here these values would be what you would expect. So um, now uh, I would also particularly like to highlight the comparison of uh, the models with a few pre-LGM paleo sea level indicators from uh, the west coast in Scandinavia. And this first one being close to Bergen in the Fjusanga Valley, where we have uh, Eemian marine sediments deposited that suggest that sea level was about 30 to 40 meters higher than the present day during the last interglacial. Uh, and as you probably know, the global mean sea level for that time period is expected to be somewhere between six and nine meters higher than today. And therefore these uh, observations have previously been used to suggest some new tectonic movements. And there is also uh, another site uh, further to the south on the island of Kamhoi uh, that is highlighted here in gray uh, with similar results. Um, but with the models we have here, we show uh, that actually the, the uh, elevation of these Eemian marine sediments can be explained in time by glacial erosion of the adjacent glacial valleys and fjords, as well as a component of inner shelf erosion, giving rise to an isostatic uplift since the Eemian of about 40 meters. So this is also the order of magnitude that we can expect uh, for these processes on glacial interglacial timescales uh, for a setting such as the Norwegian margin. Okay. So I have just a, a few slides still. As I mentioned, I would like to show some preliminary results from a study where we have uh, tried to model the Scandinavian ice sheet over a glacial cycle and then trying to vary the uh, underlying topography. And I'll just say a very brief, uh, uh, briefly a very few things about this model and then I'll show you uh, some results uh, on a slide. So this is actually the first time we're trying to use this step integrated second order shallow ice approximation on the, a large scale ice sheet uh, as the Fenoscandian ice sheet. And uh, we have used temperature and precipitation uh, forcings based on gradients from climate models for the LGM and reanalysis data for the present day. Uh, and uh, we have a positive view positive degree day model for the surface mass balance. And then we have, we forced the model in a transient evolution driven by a glacial in glaciation index. So basically you, we scale the climate between LGM and present day using uh, the Delta 18 curve. Uh, and then we have tried to uh, let the model run on different topographies. And that's what I will uh, show you now. So um, just uh, highlighting a few things. 
this is the, again the preliminary pre preliminary results by PhD student Gustav, and I hope that he will uh, manage to um, get these results out uh, soon. So uh, to the left here, you see actually our reference model. So that this is running the ice sheet on the present day topography. And um, if you, uh, what you can notice is that uh, when the ice uh, starts to uh, go into the North Sea, uh, it will meet up. We, so in this study, we don't actually model the British ice sheet, but we have an, a, an ice wall in the middle of the North Sea representing the British ice sheet that the, that the ice sheet would uh, meet. And when that happens, you have this ice saddle in the North Sea that will actually change completely the, um, the flow patterns of the ice. So it means actually in our model here, we don't have uh, any time where we have ice flow in the Norwegian channel all the way from, uh, from Oslo and to the, to the North Sea fan here uh, on the mapping. So I think that's very interesting actually. Um, so then the next slide here, uh, in this model, we have uh, filled the bathymetry. Uh, so sort of removing these large glacial troughs that we see on the sea floor today. Uh, and what we see when we do that, um, and first of all, I just mentioned that that's, uh, it's sort of uh, meant to represent uh, a pre, uh, a time prior to, the large uh, glaciations in the area that could be around the mid Pleistocene transition or so, at least before the formation of the Norwegian Channel. So I know the Norwegian Channel is still on the figure here, but it's just for reference shown on the present day topography. But what we see in this model is that actually when you fill up the bathymetry, the ice propagates both faster and further southwards. Uh, and also the ice sheets uh, will merge more quickly in the North Sea. And at the maximum extent, you have about 10% more ice, uh, but also at some point during the um, advanced phase, you have up to 30% more ice uh, in the ice sheet, simply because we fill in the bathymetry uh, that the ice is uh, flowing on. And then the last model here to the right, it's what we call a pre-glacial topography and bathymetry. So here we, as I showed you before, we remove all the glacial sediments from the offshore and put them all back in, in the fjords on the, on the inner shelf. Uh, and what we see here is uh, an ice sheet that is actually about 5% uh, smaller in volume during the maximum extent. And uh, it never, emerges with the, the British one or it never makes it to the to this to, to this ice wall in the North Sea because the bathymetry is basically too deep and it's the same uh, pattern we see on the Norwegian shelf. Uh, the ice sheet cannot uh, grow as big because uh, the water depths are too big uh, very quickly. Yeah. So this was actually just very briefly uh, showing some results from Gustav's PhD thesis that I hope that will be out there very soon. And then I just have one final slide. And I just wanted to mention here in this uh, group that I have a new project starting in August where we will work on these uh, some similar themes, but in Greenland, and we have this ambitious plan to collect information on sediment volumes that have been produced by the Greenland ice sheet all the way since ice inception, using the seismic uh, data that you see here on the figure. And uh, I just wanted to mention that I will be looking for two PhD students uh, during the fall. So if you have any good candidates, I would be very happy if you would uh, send them my way. Yeah. So with this, uh, yeah, I'm done. Thank you so much, Vivi. This is a great trip across the Atlantic. Yes, thank you. So, so should I stop sharing? Um, keep sharing because maybe we want you to, to go back to some slides uh, as people ask questions. So the, the chat is open uh, for you to, to write your question. We will read them to Vivi. Um, but 
giving you a bit of time to to write them. And of course, if you just want to, to ask your questions uh, uh, live, you can also raise your hand and we can uh, help you unmute yourselves. Um, I may start with a question about these last slides that we saw uh, before giving the, the floor to Michelle. Um, I, I was not aware at all with the, uh, of this uh, uh, Norway channel, uh, South of Oslo, the, and, and it's really quite impressive to see how it could help close the budget uh, that Philip uh, and colleagues uh, uh, had identified. Um, in the ICE models that uh, your students, I forgot uh, the name, unfortunately. Uh, Gustav. Gustav, Gustav was, yeah. uh, was producing. It seemed to me that the ice was always flowing southward, or the sediments of that Norway channel then always evacuated so southward. Or it looks, looking at the channel, it, it seems that it would be a feature that is flowing uh, clockwise first to the west and then to the north. But is it uh, carved by the ice itself, or is it more of a of a of a, of a um, liquid water feature that that then roots around the the ice system? Well, I mean, I think uh, it is uh, assumed that it's been formed by streaming ice. <clears throat> but actually, and that's one of the things we want to address with this uh, these models is that we don't, I mean, at least it doesn't seem that it's physically possible that the, that this could happen during the maximum extent. <clears throat> because as soon as you get this Saddle this bridge with the with the British ice sheet, then you 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 change the flow regime completely. So so in our models we seem to see this uh, different phases of uh, erosion of this uh, channel. So that's one of the things that we want to explore, uh, because actually even though you don't in the model where we fill the channel uh, up, you still have. In, in the inner parts, sort of some stirring of the ice uh, a little bit around. And I think it could be related to the fact that in our models, uh, ice, the sliding of the ice at the bed is uh, more effective when it's sliding on sediment instead of when it's sliding on bedrock. So you can sort of explain how you get the inner parts of the channel formed and the, the outermost part also sort of shows up by itself. Um, because you have the gradient towards the shelf edge, but then the middle part, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, I think, and we have to explore that further. But uh, so I think actually we, with these models, we will maybe channels, uh, ch um, what's it called? We will uh, challenge this idea that the, the channel was formed uh, in one complete um, phase. Yeah, but it's interesting. And that's really what we wanted to try to understand. Like if you fill in the channel, can you actually then form it, right? Because one thing is to have flow in the channel when it's already there, yeah. but can we actually form this channel that it has this very pe peculiar uh, shape around the South of Norway? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, before I continue. Yeah, yeah, I have a quick question. Um, if if nobody has yet written anything in the chat, so I was just I was just curious when you're talking about um, the the erosion of the shelf, were you thinking about it more as as a uniform kind of erosion all over, or was it is it incision and like um, topo do you, does it create topography, underwater topography and things like that? Did did you even consider it in your modeling? Um, so so. That part, I wouldn't really call it modeling. It's more like, um, you know, trying to reconstruct in a simple way and then doing the mass uh, budgets uh, calculations. Um, so I think the, the idea that people have about uh, the erosion here is simply that because it's uh, sediments, even though they are, you know, for instance, Mesozoic consolidated, uh, I mean, consolidated sediments that would be harder to erode than 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 the glacial uh, sediments of the last glacial cycle for instance um, they would be easier to erode than the bedrock and that's why I think people have just assumed that 
when you when I started to uh, move out on the shelf that you would simply be able to just erode these uh, older sediments fairly uh, easily. But it hasn't really been um, investigated much. And I mean, maybe they were eroded, you know, much uh, further back in time. I mean, that's also an argument that people have used. You know, if, if these low relief surfaces that we see in the landscape, they were uplifted already in the Pliocene. Uh, probably these older sediments were eroded already back then. And, but then we don't have to add them in this uh, budget calculation with the glacial sediments. And then we have an even larger mismatch. So this is even really being, you know, trying to include as much as we can in this uh, budget calculation even though I think that uh, if these sediments were really there uh, and if they were more extensive, maybe also, they were probably also eroded already prior to the glaciations. Yeah. But yeah, it's difficult to be more precise, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. So you're just you're just going for the, the maximum amount that, that you can you can get to try and explain this this gap basically. Yeah, I mean the maximum amount that we can add with within this framework where we uh, don't have any uh, additional tectonic uplift, right? Because you can say if you would add additional uplift, like if you would also say like you had twice as much dynamic topography than what we have seen in in some of the models, then you know we would have more space to have more sediment uh, lying there on the shelf. Yeah. We have a question by Philip. Thanks for the great talk and ask what are the constraints we currently have on the timing for the onset of the glaciation in Norway? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are some ice rafted debris um, in some of the offshore wells uh, where they see some indications of IRD uh, already very early, like 12 million years ago, I think. But as far as I understand, uh, and it's actually a very well cited paper, this one. But if you actually look at the, the figure in this paper, what you have to notice is that there's a logarithmic scale in one of the plots. So you have a lot of ice rafted debris starting from the start of the beginning of the quaternary, but everything before that is actually very low counts. So represent uh, the same number of counts that you also get at the present day. And we don't have any icebergs coming out from Norway today. So, um, yeah, I think uh, there's probably been ice in Scandinavia for most of the quaternary, but going to the shelf edge was probably after the mid Pleistocene transition. But I don't think we have much more new evidence uh, other than, than what Philip probably already knows. Yeah. Actually, following up on that, uh... Since we're talking a bit about a, a somewhat deeper time scale, is that then similar to the, the constraints available for onset of glaciation in Greenland? I mean, the same criticism has been raised. Yeah. Okay. It's a really interesting debate, right? Because in, so off Greenland, they found ice rafted debris dating back almost uh, at least 30 million years. Right. Uh, and it's really, you know, looking at specific small, I mean, clasts or gra larger grains than you would expect in a core. And then they, you know, they can see different, the grain has sort of been impacted or um, been affected in a certain way that they say this is, uh, this is an, a grain that has uh, come from ice. But it's not certain if you could get the same signal from uh, sea ice, for instance, or in other ways, getting these larger clasts out into the open ocean. 
Okay, so those those are because not because the counts are so small. Those are not drop uh, stones that are uh, as big as a, as a football. Uh, well, I think that you have from the late Miocene onwards. Oh, then okay. it's uh, picking up more, but it's more these very early ice rafted debris uh, that you have already at the Eocene Oligocene boundary. I think. I mean, you cannot know for sure, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but so, it's certainly very interesting. To try to circle back to the beginning of your talk, um, the erosion that happened potentially prior to 2.5 MA in, in Greenland, I think this was one, one of the, the hypotheses, uh, that would be part of that earlier phase of glaciation. We are not talking about a, a, an erosion by another process than, than glaciers. Is that, do you understand that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think from the late uh, Miocene, there are more evidence that there has been ice uh, in East Greenland. But so what I, the point I was trying to make is that maybe you had ice in East Greenland where you have the high topography, but not necessarily in in North uh, Greenland, where where um, where you could have had the I mean, yeah, too low topography, too dry conditions to have ice. So it means that it's not an ice sheet as the one we see today, but still an ice sheet large enough, maybe in the in East Greenland to to reach the sea. Yeah, but right. it's it's actually very interesting and something I want to explore in this new project that is starting this summer. That in the late Myo, uh, late Miocene, people have argued looking at seismic sections in East Greenland, that the ice went onto the shelf at this time. But at the same time, for instance, in the Danish area, you have uh, proxy records suggesting that the temperatures were like much higher than today. So how do you explain those two observations at the same time? You know, plus five, 10 degrees in uh, Western Europe, but ice in East Greenland going to the shelf edge. Yeah. Well, that sounds like the perfect advertisement for the jobs that you're opening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a reminder yeah. for everyone who is still here, uh, DV is looking for PhD students uh, to start soon. Um, you know where to find her. Uh, we've hit the hour, and I think that uh, we are going to, to stop here, except if there's a one last question. Uh, the talk will be posted on YouTube and uh, there will be also a, a discussion channel open on Discord if you just want to, to drop a question there uh, a bit later, we'll keep an eye on it. In the meantime, thank you all. Thank you, Vivi, for uh, coming back to your old uh, stomping ground and telling us and about thank you for having me. high latitudes. Uh, and uh, have a nice summer, everyone.